Welcome to week one of the Inclusive Learning Network's small open online course on Universal Design for Learning and Apps. This week, Mindy Johnson from CAS provides an excellent overview of the UDL framework and shares with us how UDL continues to evolve with the latest updates to the UDL guidelines and principles. Following the webinar, your instructors, Luis Perez, Kendra Grant, and Betsy Dalton, will provide you with some instructions and next steps for how to proceed with the course. Now sit back and enjoy this excellent presentation from Mindy Johnson. Hi, I'm Mindy Johnson. I'm an instructional designer and research associate at CAST. CAST is a nonprofit research and development organization in Wakefield, Massachusetts. CAST coined the phrase universal design for learning over 30 years ago, and today all of our focus remains on UDL. I want to begin by telling you a little bit about my UDL journey. Perhaps you'll see some similarities in how I came to embrace universal design for learning. Next, we'll focus on assumptions and beliefs about teaching, learners, and learning. And finally, we'll do a high-level preview of universal design for learning. Over the next few weeks, you'll have an opportunity to do a deep dive. So for today, my goal is to do a quick but thorough overview. I was a special education teacher in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. As you can see, my office had lots of pictures, materials, and books, and hidden in there is also a computer. Before I even knew about universal design for learning, I was incorporating it into my practice. Many teachers do. The goal of understanding UDL as a framework, I believe, is to apply the UDL principles with intent. When I was a special education teacher, I co-taught science, math, and history. My role was in cooperation with the classroom teacher to adapt some of the assignments by modifying the task and materials while maintaining the goals and curriculum standards. Inevitably, the teachers would look at the activities, resources, and materials I created and say, you know, this stuff would benefit a whole bunch of students in my class. We ended up redesigning a lot of the materials the teachers traditionally used in the classroom. Those resources were then shared out with the other teachers in the department. So we had all these wonderfully designed lessons and learning experiences that all sorts of students could easily access. They were designed with variability in mind from the start, so we didn't have to go back and modify them later. At the time, I didn't know we were actually implementing UDL practices. Eventually, I went back to grad school and I got my master's degree in technology and education. And now I work at CAST and all I do is universal design for learning. <laughs> my desk looks much like it did when I was a teacher but now I have two computers, multiple screens, an iPod, and my phone. I came to teaching with assumptions and beliefs about learning. I also came to teaching with assumptions and beliefs about my learners. We all do, whether we recognize them or not. Take a moment to think about your own assumptions and beliefs about learning and learners. UDL also brings with it assumptions and beliefs about learning and learners. The UDL assumptions and beliefs are based on neuroscience and research in the learning sciences. The first we'll talk about is the belief that learning is the dynamic interaction of the individual with the environment or context. In other words, when we think about learning, we also have to think about the environment or context where that learning is happening. In addition, learner ability or perceived disability is at that intersection where the individual interacts with the environment or context. Let me give you an example from my own life. When I was a young girl, my mom made me, well, okay, she forced me to take piano lessons. Each week, the teacher would put the sheet music in front of me and I would try to read the notes. I would finger count or do every good boy does fine. I put stickers on the keys to try to remember the notes. I even used flashcards. Nothing helped me. My mom, who was a pianist, used to play my homework at night and I would listen to what she was playing. The next day I would go down to the piano and play what I had heard the night before. She thought I was getting much better at reading the notes, when actually I was getting much better at listening to her play and copying that. When I went into competitions, I would win if I prepared ahead of time. But whenever the judges put sheet music in front of me, I couldn't play it. The question is, was I disabled or was I gifted? I didn't learn to play the conventional way yet I could still play extremely well. Giving me different options or pathways allowed me to demonstrate what I could do, something to think about as we explore ability, disability, and learning. 
Another assumption that UDL makes is that learners are varied. In any learning environment, you are always going to get a range of learners, different background knowledge, different ways of accessing and processing information, different temperaments, different school experiences. If you have a chance, watch the TEDx talk by Todd Rose called The Myth of Average. This video and the others I'll mention are available in this week's follow-up resources. In the video, Todd uses the analogy of designing cockpits for fighter pilots to highlight how designing a physical space using this mythical average actually hinders the pilots from effectively doing their jobs. He then connects that to how we design instruction and says, if we design our instruction for the average learner, we are actually designing for no one. That really resonated with me. Variability Matters is another video by Todd where he uses shoe size rather than fighter planes as an analogy. The End of Average is a more recent one by Todd to check out if you have time. Here's another way to look at it. If you've ever skied, you know there are multiple ways for the skier to get down the hill. The green circle is the easiest, the blue square is intermediate, the black diamond is advanced, and the double black diamond is the most challenging path of all. In other words, there are all sorts of ways to get down the hill to get to the same destination. Now, if we design this experience like we often design classroom learning experiences, there will only be one way down the hill, an average or middle ability hill. For those starting out, this may be too challenging. It's embarrassing when you can't get down the hill without falling. For those who are average skiers, there's no challenge, no way to grow or develop their skills. For those who are capable of skiing the black diamond routes, the average route is too easy. They get quickly down the hill with nothing to do, and helping others down the hill gets old very quickly. When we design for the average, we design for no one. To resolve this, we need to pay attention to the variability of our learners from the start so that we can present them with real learning opportunities with just the right amount of support and challenge. Universal Design for Learning also makes the assumption that the purpose of education is to develop expert learners. So what is an expert learner? UDL asserts that expert learners are purposeful, motivated learners, resourceful, knowledgeable learners, strategic, goal-directed learners. Just like this dog is an expert at self-control, patiently waiting, the goal of UDL is for every learner to develop expert skills in learning. Imagine if we let students know about these goals and then design learning to help them reach these goals. Powerful stuff. Universal Design for Learning makes the assumption that knowledge goals related to the understanding of concepts, content, and facts should, when possible, be separate from skill goals such as writing an essay, giving a speech, or computation. Often goals are confounded with double goals, or the means of attaining one goal is linked to the goal itself. For example, take these two typical learning goals. Both actually represent two goals each. A skill goal, such as writing an essay or delivering a speech, and a concept goal that includes historical understanding. UDL wants us to separate these goals, or in other words, separate the means from the goal. If the goal is understanding the importance of the historical events, there are many ways for students to demonstrate their knowledge that acknowledges learner variability. When we compound goals, it's difficult to determine whether a student was unsuccessful because of a lack of understanding or if they had difficulty with the means of expressing what they know. Just think back to my piano playing. I would have been considered a failure if the only way to assess me was through reading sheet music. Traditionally, we create lessons for the mythical average learner and then modify according to who struggles or who needs more help and maybe provide extra stuff for those who require more challenge. We need to move beyond this. We need to move beyond retrofitting curriculum and reactionary accommodations. UDL asks us to address learner variability from the onset in the design of our curriculum with the goal of becoming an expert learner. This is probably a familiar puzzle to a lot of you. It's a Rubik's Cube. We could say this cube is designed for the average person. Many people can see the colors and manipulate it with their hands, even if they can't solve it. <laughs> but who might this not work for? 
Perhaps people who are colorblind would have trouble distinguishing the red from the green. Or someone who is visually impaired could, would be unable to see the colors at all. A traditional response to this problem is to create a different Rubik's Cube to meet different needs. Here's a very beautiful brailled Rubik's Cube for those with vision impairments. But what's the problem with this one? The brailled cube might not work for someone who is sighted who really does respond to the colors on the cube. Or it might not work for someone who can't read braille. We also now have two cubes to deal with and it still doesn't really address the needs of someone who is colorblind. That would require yet a third cube. Here is a cube that is designed for the widest possible range of users. It uses color for those who play based on color, but also includes raised symbols for those who may not be able to read color or for those who need to feel the information rather than see it. Ultimately, you could create this in a digital online form with auditory feedback so someone who can't interact with the cube physically can still play the game. Many of you may be familiar with the book Universal Design for Learning, Teaching Every Student in the Digital Age, written in 2004. This book introduced the term UDL to educators. In 2008, the UDL guidelines were released. They ask us to think about our learning environments and provide our learners with the following UDL principles. Multiple means of representation, which means provide a variety of ways for learners to access information and learning. Multiple means of action and expression, which means to provide a variety of ways for learners to show what they know and understand. And multiple means of engagement, which means to provide a variety of ways to recruit learner interest, motivation, and self-regulation. In 2014, CAST published a new book called Universal Design for Learning, Theory and Practice, in which the representation of the principles and guidelines were flipped. The reason, I believe, is to help us dig deeper into the guidelines, move beyond the low-lying fruit, and apply UDL with the highest degree of fidelity based on our understanding of and experience with UDL. Offering a new representation of the UDL guidelines also helps us remember that UDL is a living thing. It grows and changes as our understandings about learning evolve and change based on our research. The most obvious change, engagement is now first. This comes a lot from research at CAST and from neuroscience, which tells us that engagement is central to student learning. Representation comes next in this organizer, followed by action and expression. The order of the guidelines under each of the principles is also reversed. This was done to emphasize the internal, intrinsic, metacognitive work that students must do if we want them to become purposeful and motivated, resourceful and knowledgeable, and strategic and goal-directed. So let's begin with engagement with the goal of purposeful, motivated learners. Provide options for recruiting interest. This is what people usually think about and focus on when we talk about engagement. The anticipatory set, getting students' attention, providing choice. Provide options for sustaining effort and persistence. This guideline explores ways to support learners in becoming more resilient to persist in the face of difficulty and to give their best effort in all situations. Provide options for self-regulation. This focuses on helping students learn how to self-monitor and self-assess their motivation, stress, and behavior, as well as their states of mind, and then apply various strategies to help them redirect or reinforce their behaviors. Next is representation with the goal of resourceful, knowledgeable learners. Provide options for perception, such as offering ways to customize the display of information and including alternatives for visual and audio information is relatively easy with a plethora of devices and apps now available. Provide options for language, mathematical expressions, and symbols. This promotes multiple media, moving away from text-only instruction. This also ensures that students have not only options to help them understand text, but also options to understand symbols and mathematical notation. Provide options for comprehension. This focuses on activating background knowledge, highlighting big ideas, and guiding the process of information to help students move beyond basic recall to conceptual understanding and higher order thinking. 
Lastly is action and expression with the goal of strategic goal-directed learners. Provide options for physical action. Many of the technologies such as word prediction, speech to text, and screen readers were at one time considered assistive technology. UDL sees them as just another tool for students to use, another option for expression and communication. Today, this principle encourages the teacher to optimize access to these tools so that it isn't onerous or embarrassing to do so. As we'll discover in this course, online tools and inexpensive apps provide powerful tools with easy access. Provide options for expression and communication. This encourages teachers to allow the use of a variety of media for students to meet curricular goals. For example, if the goal was to demonstrate historical understanding of a series of events, then the student could make a video, create a website or wiki, send out a series of tweets, design a Facebook page, or record an online conversation with the author of a book. Of course, if this goal is skill-based, to write an essay, for example, we might want to provide options for the topic focus. We can also offer a variety of tools, both paper-based and digital, to help students construct and compose the essay, such as graphic organizers, sticky notes, sketching, or mind mapping. Provide options for executive function. This focuses on guiding student goal setting so they don't aim too high or too low. UDL isn't about dumbing down the curriculum. It's about helping every single student achieve high standards. Any task that requires planning, organization, memory, time management, and flexible thinking is part of executive functions. Helping students understand, support, and strengthen these skills is part of any UDL classroom. If you want to learn more, be sure to check out these resources. These links are also available in the resource section of the course. Thank you very much for letting me be a part of your UDL journey, and please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. A big thank you to Mindy for sharing her knowledge and expertise with us as part of this course. Now that you've watched this webinar, please make sure to click on the UDL Overview tab on the course website at www.soocforlearning.com. That's www.soc, the number four, learning.com for this week's tasks as well as additional resources that will help you learn more about Universal Design for Learning. And remember that each week we'll have a Twitter chat as well as open office hours. This will be a chance for you to share with your colleagues and have an informal discussion with your instructors about any of the topics and ideas that have been discussed that week. And if at any time you have any questions about the course, please email us, Luis, Betsy, or Kendra, at soocforlearning at gmail.com. That's S-O-O-C, the number four, learning at gmail.com. We're really excited that you've joined us for this course, and we're certainly looking forward to learning from and with you.